good morning, church. I want to thank Doug for filling in while we were on vacation for a few days. Uh, he's a good preacher, and I'm thankful for Doug being on staff with us and looking forward to beginning a new series this morning. What are we going to be talking about for the next few weeks? Oh, yeah, Revelation. I've had more people already ahead of time tell me how much they're looking forward to this series. I think more than anything else I can remember. It's not an accident that Revelation is at the end of the book. Revelation takes themes that's in the Bible and brings them all into focus. We're going to be looking at that in the next few weeks. Someone said that Genesis and Revelation are, are good bookends to the Bible, and I, I agree with that. Because in, in Genesis, we see how sin began, and in Revelation, we'll see how sin will end. In, in Genesis, we see how civilization and history began, and in Revelation, we're going to see how civilization and history will ultimately end. So I'm thankful you are here this morning. The very first part of January this year, one of my personal goals, uh, and I had never I had never done this before. I said, I want to not just read Revelation, I want to study Revelation. And, and I didn't know at that time, but just a few months later, God put it upon my spirit to, to preach a series out of Revelation. So here we are today. Uh, have you ever been tempted to kind of give up on God? Have you ever tempted what's it worth? Have you ever felt like just saying, oh, it's useless. I don't think I can hang in there much longer. Well, I want you to, I want you to hear God's word to us today from chapter one. We're going to read the entire chapter. I think it's that important. So turn with me to Revelation chapter one. I'm reading from the NIV. The revelation from Jesus Christ or of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God, our Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Verse 12, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. 
I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys, death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. Lord, you are able to give us your wisdom. I pray that we will be able to discern what the Spirit is saying this morning to your people. Lord, permit me to preach your wonderful word, the gospel. We thank you for our Savior, our risen Lord, who is alive. And Lord, your Spirit is here to help us. So take the written word, Lord, and let it become the living word. And go down deep and transform us from the inside out. And Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Anytime you mention the book of Revelation, you get different reactions. Some people are fascinated, can't wait. Some people are a little afraid, a little anxious. Some people are nervous. Some, some people are intrigued. But my desire this morning is that we'll hear and see the word of the Lord, that we'll see Jesus like John did. And we'll never be changed when we see Jesus. The word revelation, the Greek is apocalypse, which simply means an unveiling. What had been veiled is now unveiled. What had not been seen is now able to be seen. So we're going to be looking at what God is revealing to us through the revelation of Jesus. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ primarily in the book of Revelation. It's not primarily a, a revelation of end time events. It's not primarily a revelation of the rapture. It's not primarily a revelation of, of the Antichrist and the beast. It, it's primarily a revelation of who Jesus is. So this morning, I pray that we'll see Jesus like never before because he's the one, he's the only one who can truly transform and change our lives. And, and I want us to be gracious as we go through this study with each other because you can get 10 scholars in the same room and all of them are going to disagree a little bit on Revelation. You can get 10 people who, who love the Lord Jesus with all their heart, who are truly Christ followers, and they're not going to always agree on how to interpret Revelation. Some people interpret Revelation like, well, it, it, it happened during John's life or the first century. Some people interpret Revelation as it, it's just continuing through history, and there's just a smidgen that hasn't been revealed yet. Some people look at Revelation as uh, from beginning in chapter 4 forward is, is what's in the future. And then some people just look at Revelation as kind of ideally that it's just, a, it's just a picture of the battle between good and evil. So our, our goal, at least my goal, and I hope it will be our goal, is that we not uh, have enough information and have it properly stored that we can win an argument, that we can prove what's going to happen. My goal, I hope our goal, is that we will, we will look to Jesus and let him be our living hope, that in Christ we will realize that I, we, are, we are blessed because of him. Did you notice that blessing in verse 3? There's a blessing for the one who reads it aloud, and, and when you think back to the biblical days, not everybody could read, and there were manuscripts. Everybody didn't have books. So the reader would stand up and read to the entire congregation. So there's a blessing pronounced upon the one who reads the revelation, but there's also a blessing pronounced upon those who hear the revelation and take it to heart to obey God's word. The blessing, I've had so many people say, oh, I, I, I want us to do revelation because I want to be blessed. There's a promise of blessing. Yes, there's a promise of blessing for those who hear it and for those who obey God's word. Do you want to be blessed? Well, listen to God's word and do what he asks us to do. I want us to kind of dive into chapter 1 by looking at John for a few moments. First thing I'd like to say about John is he was a servant. In verse 1, we're reminded of that. It says that this revelation 
came from God the Father to Jesus Christ the Son to an angel and then to John. And it says to his servant John. John received this revelation of Jesus Christ because he was a servant. Would you like to have a fresh vision of who God is and what Jesus wants to do in your life? Uh, well, we have to be servants. You go back to Matthew chapter 4 and you read where, John, where Jesus called John. He just called Simon Peter and Andrew. And then he, he saw James and John, two brothers, in their father's boat, mending the nets, sons of Zebedee. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And immediately... They dropped their nets, they got out of their dad's boat and they started following Jesus. Now isn't that commitment? You want to be blessed? Well, be a servant of Jesus Christ. Do whatever he asks you to do. I like what Paul said in Romans as he began in that wonderful treatise, that doctrinal book. He said, I am Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Do you see, you see how all that works? Paul said, he didn't say, first of all, I'm an apostle. Listen to me. Paul said, I'm a servant. I'm called to be an apostle. Jesus determines our function, brothers and sisters. We're first of all called to be servants. John was a servant, and he was able to hear what the Spirit was saying. The second thing we see in this passage is that, that John was in the Spirit. Notice in verse 9 and 10. John was exiled on the island of Patmos because he was preaching the Word, and he loved Jesus. And he was put on that little island about 10 miles long and 6 miles wide out in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey. And John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now that's a beautiful, beautiful sentence. Because there's only two options. You and I right now, we're either in the flesh or we're in the Spirit. You're either trying to worship in the flesh uh, you're all hooked up properly to Jesus and you're worshiping in the Spirit. John chose to be in the Spirit. Even though he could have said, why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve all this? I've been faithful to you. I've followed you. You, you said that you were going to be with me. Why? No, no, he didn't choose that option, did he? On Sunday, on the Lord's Day, he was in the Spirit. Jesus says to us this morning, it's found in John chapter 4, true worshipers, they're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So we, we need to make sure that we're, we're not worshiping in our own spirits and contrary to the truth of God's Word, but if we're, if we're following Scripture, if we're following who He is and the the things that he's told us about himself and what we must do. And then we say, okay, Lord, I, I, I want to surrender. I'm your servant. And Lord, I'm ready to worship you. I'm ready to just do whatever you ask me to do. Lord, I want to be in your presence. I just want you. Uh, then we're ready to hear the word, the revelation, Jesus. And then that leads us, look, look in verse 11 and 12. The Spirit spoke to John. Because John was a servant, because he was in the spirit, he had the right mindset, he was truly worshiping God, the spirit spoke to him. Do you want the spirit to speak to you this morning? Well, I urge you, don't get too hung up on what Pastor Mike says today. Oh, but be hung up on what Jesus is saying. Get in the spirit. Okay, God, I, I'm just laying everything aside and I want you. And then then the Spirit will speak to you. God speaks in different ways. He speaks through circumstances. Sometimes He speaks through people. He speaks through prayer. He speaks through His Word, but it's always by His Spirit. So let's let the Spirit speak to us today and, and as we journey together these next few weeks through His Word, through the, through the revelation of Jesus. And then fourthly, I want you to see that John saw a revelation of Jesus. John saw Jesus, verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. This chapter pivots on verse 12. John heard a voice behind him. It sounded like thunder, mighty rushing waters. 
And it says he turned to see the voice, to see who it was. You see, John engaged. John didn't run away. Too many times we, we, we won't turn to the Lord, we, we turn away from him. And that's the essence of true repentance, isn't it? Repentance means we're turning to God and we're turning away from everything else. We're just turning to him because we want him. So John fully engaged and he turned to see the voice, who it was speaking to him. And that's when he saw, he saw the vision. He saw the Lord in a a long flowing robe with a golden sash. He is our great high priest. Somebody say, hallelujah. He is our great high priest. He helps us in our time of need. His hair was white like wool, white as snow, full of wisdom and pure. He is. His eyes were like blazing fire. Wow, he, he sees right through us, doesn't he? He sees who we really are. There's no fool in the Lord. Eyes of fire. Uh, it happens all the time. It happened earlier this morning. Somebody said, well, the preacher's back. You better watch out. And I said, well, the Lord's eyes, he sees us all the time, doesn't he? He sees us all. Eyes of fire. Feet of bronze like they've been in the fire. Brothers and sisters, he's been through the fiery furnace for us. And he's come out on the other side. He's alive forevermore. So we praise his holy name this morning. His voice was like mighty rivers. And then he says it was like a two-edged sword. His voice penetrates. His voice cannot be stopped. John saw a vision. These are symbols of Jesus. Of course, in glory, Jesus is not going to be exactly like that. These are symbols of, of how he's ministering to us right now. In glory, and when he comes back, he's not going to be exactly like that. But this is who he revealed himself to John as the great I am. And then John saw Jesus. Who is Jesus? This chapter mentions who he is, what he does, and what he will do. Let's talk about that for just a few minutes this morning. In verse 5 and 6, we see who Jesus is. The first thing we notice is he is the faithful witness. Jesus is the faithful witness. He's going to speak the true word. A week ago, yesterday, Susan and I, we we were headed to the beach for a few days and we'd gotten off the interstate and we were in Escambia County and traffic had slowed down. There's a red light about a block ahead of us and traffic was stopping at the red light and, and we stopped, but then I heard a crash behind us and I looked in the rear view mirror and then I heard a second crash and then we were part of the third crash and then, then our car, the fourth, we, 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 we went into the fifth car. There was a five car pileup and fortunately we're, we're okay, but our, our bumper and our front bumper were damaged and we're going to have to have that worked on, but I'm thankful that that, that our children and our three grandchildren were in front of all that. But a couple of days later, I got a call from the insurance guy, and he said, would, would you just tell us what you saw? Tell us what happened. And I began telling him, and he, he asked some questions. When I, he said, well, did the airbags go off in that first, the one that caused the chain reaction? I said, I, I know the airbags went off in the, car, in the second car, but I can't really... I'm not real sure. And then he went on to say, well, were you stopped? And I said, yeah, we were stopped. And, and did, did the tow truck take off the first and the second and third? I said, I, I remember the tow truck getting the first car, but I don't really remember getting the second car. And I, he said, well, thank you. You're, you're just telling me what you know. He said, I tried to be a good witness. I tried to just say, Here, here's what I remember but I didn't remember it all even just two days later. I didn't get it all in. I was just focused on we were okay. But hallelujah, Jesus is the faithful witness. He knows it all, doesn't he? He sees everything. He is the faithful witness. The second thing we see here is he, not only is he the faithful witness, but he is the first to rise from the dead. Verse 5 says he's the faithful witness and he's the first to rise. Somebody said, well, didn't, didn't he raise people in the New Testament? Yeah, we know he raised of three, but those folks died again. See, Jesus was the first to be raised in glory, never to die again. That's why he says, I am the resurrection 
and I am life. If you believe in me, even though you die, you'll live because I'm alive forevermore. He's the faithful witness. He's got the final word. We, we live in a world uh, that's bombarded with different philosophies. We live in a world that's got all kind of ideas. We live in a world with a lot of different values and oftentimes the values are antagonistic to each other. What are we to believe? Well, dear friends, let's believe the faithful witness because he is the resurrected son of God. He's alive forevermore. That settles it, doesn't it? He's the first to rise from the dead. We will follow in his footprints. And then it says, the, the, the third thing right there, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He has the final word. You think about all the kings that have ever ruled and reigned and all the kings that are reigning right now and ruling and those that will rule and reign. Jesus, he is the ruler of all the kings. That helps us understand his significance. That Jesus Christ came down from heaven and he was born in the stable and he grew up and lived a perfect life and he conquered every problem that came up against him and he healed every disease that was presented to him and he didn't charge a penny for his services and then he went out to Calvary and he died for our sins and on the third day the spirit of holiness raised him to life and he's alive forevermore and he is the ruler of all the kings that's who he is he's faithful he's the one who has the the final word because he is alive forevermore. And then we see in verse 5 and 6 what he, what he does. Three things. He loves us. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? The end of verse 5 says he loves us. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. That's past tense. I'm thankful God loved the world and he, he gave his only son. But it says here in the revelation of who Jesus is that he loves us. Right now, he loves us. He loves you and me. Harry Ironside was a great pastor. He pastored the Moody Church in Chicago for about 20 years. He went home to be with the Lord in 1951. Harry Ironside told a story about Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist. Harry Ironside was in Virginia and had conversation with an Episcopalian priest. And the, the priest told Harry Ironside his encounter with Dwight L. Moody. And he said, I was a student at Cambridge. We thought that was just the center of culture in the whole world. And we heard that Dwight L. Moody was going to be coming to preach to us. And there were a bunch of us mad because what's that hillbilly from the United States that murders the king's language? It was, it was said about Dwight L. Moody that he's the only person who could pronounce Jerusalem with just one syllable. <laughs> and those folks from Cambridge, they said, we don't want him coming and speaking to us. So a group of those students sat on the front row. They were going to disrupt his sermon. They were going to jeer him and jackal. And, and Ira Sankey, his great soloist, stood up to sing. And when he sang, the congregation was just hushed. And then without any introduction, D.L. Moody stood up and he pointed at that row of students on the front. He said, gentlemen, I want you to know that God loves you. And later in the sermon, he said it again. And his grammar was not good. He said, young gentlemen, I want you to know God loves you, for he do. He said, for he do. And that got their attention. And they listened. And that Episcopalian priest said, he came back to talk about how much Jesus loved this fallen world and how he gave himself for us. And I started listening like never before. And before that sermon was over, I committed my life to Jesus. I want to tell you this morning, brothers and sisters, God loves you, for he do. <laughs> he does. He loves us. That's who Jesus is. He's faithful. He's risen. He has the final word, but he loves us. And it says he liberates us from our sins. He frees us from our sins by his own blood, verse 6 says. Oh, he liberates us. He frees us from our sins. Only Jesus can do that. And all through the book of Revelation, we will be focusing upon the cross because the cross is one of the most important things that we will 
encounter in the book of Revelation. He has freed us from our sins by shedding his own blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I praise his name this morning for the blood of Jesus frees us from our sins. A little girl one time was about to have her fifth birthday party and her mother had taught her a song. They had rehearsed it and she was going to sing the song when everybody arrived at her birthday party. The time came and the mom said to her five-year-old daughter, Hannah, what are you going to do for us right now? And she said, nothing. And the mom said, aren't you going to sing a song for us? And the little girl said, no, I'm not. Hun, please sing the song that no, I'm not. So the mom took her to the bedroom and, and put her in her closet and shut the door. She says, stay here till I come back. She came back a few minutes later hoping that her little girl was ready to sing the song. And she opened the door. She said, hon, what have you been doing? And she said, I've been spitting. I said, you've been spitting? I've been spitting on the floor. I've been spitting in your shoes. I've been spitting on your clothes. And I'm just waiting for more spit. You see, dear friends, that's what sin is. Sin is just waiting for more spit. Jesus came to free us not from just the sins that we've committed, but the sin nature within that, will, that causes us to want to spit. He liberates us from our sins. He frees us. Jesus says, if you know the Son, the truth will set you free. A slave can't set himself free, but the Son can set you free. If you're in Christ, you're free this morning. Oh, what a glorious image that he loves us and he liberates us from our sins. And then the third thing we see in verse 6 is that he leaves us with a ministry. It says he, he calls us to be his priests, part of the kingdom of the priesthood of believers. He loves us. He's freed us from our sins. And now he's given us a ministry. We're to be part of the royal priesthood. I like what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are a chosen generation, you and I. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special people, that we will proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Oh, I pray that this morning we'll get a vision of who Jesus is and we'll see him as the one who frees us up from our sins. And then, then he gives us a ministry he calls us, we're, we're part of the kingdom of priests. Priests have one basic function, and that's to bring people closer to God. You, that sums it up in a nutshell. The priest brings God and people close. In the Old Testament, the priest would tell folks about the sacrifice system and how it worked in an attempt to bring people close to God. Now, because Jesus is the, he's the final Passover lamb, he died for our sins. And now he's calling you and me to be a part of the priesthood of believers. Yeah, he loves us, and he frees us, and he's given us a ministry. And then we see what he's going to do. Look in verse 7. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. When Jesus comes again, there's going to be a universal impact. Every eye is going to see him. Jesus lets us know about this in Matthew chapter 24 where he's asked about the end of time and he gives several different signs and, and then he says, and then the end will come. You'll look up in the clouds and you'll see the Son of Man appearing. Ray Stedman was an evangelist. He said he was in Los Angeles once. There were Christian pastors and Jewish rabbis and they were talking together. One Jewish rabbi said to him, said, when the Messiah comes, we are going to say welcome, and you Christians are going to say welcome again. And Ray, Ray Stedman said to this Jewish rabbi, well, what do you think Jesus is going to say? And he said, uh -uh, I think he'll say no comment. Dear friends, he, 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 he will not say no comment when he comes. He will say basically, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. He will not say no comment. When he comes, as the angel in Acts chapter 1 said, every eye will see him. He'll come back the same way he left. 
And it says in the middle of verse 7, even those who pierced him, even the Jews will recognize that Jesus is the Lord, he's Savior. And then it says, all the people on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. I think that's a, a picture of Philippians chapter 2, where because Jesus humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross, that God the Father exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is Lord. As we move toward the conclusion and prepare for Holy Communion, in verse 17, 18, and 19, we see a couple important things. When John saw this revelation of Jesus, it says he fell at his feet as though he were dead. I could have added another point. He was slain in the spirit. <laughs> he saw him and he, like he was dead. Kind of like Isaiah in chapter 6. Isaiah saw the Lord high and holy and lifted up. And Isaiah was never the same. But Jesus did three things. John, his servant, fell at his feet as though he were dead. And the first thing the Bible tells us is that Jesus touched him. He reached out with his right hand and he touched John. Isn't that just like Jesus? He was always touching people. In seminary, they call it the meaningful touch. When you go into a hospital room and somebody's in the bed sick, you, before you leave, you need to at least reach out at least one time and, and provide a meaningful touch, maybe the shoulder, their hand, their arm, because a touch is so important. Well, Jesus touched John, just like he touched the lepers before he healed them, just like he touched the blind men before he gave them their sight. Jesus touched John. I pray this morning when we celebrate communion that we will be open to saying, Lord, I'm your servant, I'm at your feet, and I pray that you'll touch me, Lord, you'll help me. Because I, I've made a decision to turn toward you. I'm not going to turn and walk away from you. Lord, today, maybe like never before, I'm going to turn to you. I want to encounter you because, Lord, I want my life to count. Because there are so many philosophies, so many different options. Lord, I want to trust you because you speak truth. Because you are the truth. And then Jesus reassured John. He said, don't be afraid. He touched him and then he said, don't be afraid. Because I'm the first and the last. Jesus is Alpha and Omega. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So allow his touch this morning to reassure us. We don't have to be afraid, even living in, in this world that's, that's chaotic at best. We don't have to be afraid because Jesus, our Lord, is with us. He's with us all the way. And, and then the third thing, he, he gave him a commission. He told John to write. Write all this down. Write what he is and what you have seen and what will take place. What's your commission? What's your calling? Number one, surrender and say, Lord, I, I'm just, I just want to be your servant. And, and now I'm listening. You tell me what to do. You call me to follow in your footsteps. And the Lord says, I, you don't have to be afraid. I'm with you. Do you see him this morning? Do you hear him this morning? Do you feel him this morning? He is here. And as we celebrate communion, he's promised to touch us with his graceful hand when we kneel before him. We're going to celebrate communion again with the prepackaged set. If you'll have it ready. This is the body of Christ. He went to the cross to free us, to liberate us from our sins. And he is worthy. 
He's the only one who could take this, this, the scroll that was sealed and open it up to provide life. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. This is the blood of Jesus poured out for you and me for the forgiveness, the remission of sins. Lord, as we receive the bread and the juice this morning, we surrender and we are willing to be your, your, your bond servants, Lord, your slaves. We want you to drill a hole in our spiritual earlobe so that we know we're marked, we're yours forever. And Lord, help us. Give us a calling, a commission, so that we can follow you and know where we're headed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you will, first of all, take the piece of bread. This is the body of Christ, broken for you and me. Take and eat. And this is the blood of Christ poured out on Calvary for our redemption. Take and drink. Lord, we're thankful that you're here today as the resurrected Lord, as our Savior. Give us your peace. Lord, may we know your presence. May we experience your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.